gang, it's my privilege to bring to you a video that has taken a while to put together. We tried a while ago to do this. We had some technical difficulties. We had to get some more bits and pieces into play. And now we're ready to give to you a one of a kind video on the Stoner 63. I got my good buddy here, Monty LeClaire, Centurion Arms, Special Operations Veteran. Monty, let's kick it off a little back and forth on this weapon system. Your time in the teams you interfaced with guys who actually used this thing in combat, correct? Sure did. Some of the guys I talked to, in fact, a good buddy of mine who just retired about a year ago, is actually the last active duty Navy SEAL that just kind of retired out. And I've sat down and had good conversations with him about it. Uh, basically, they, they love the weapon system. In fact, you know, a lot of the guys, they did sit down, I saw old pictures of them, kind of thumbing through some of those things. And they'd go out back in the day and they have fond memories of it because they'd go out with a platoon of 14 guys half the guys would have stoners. Yeah. The other guys might mix it up with other weapon systems, but the stoner was like a very much, it's so lightweight for what it is and had so much firepower for them. But, uh, you know, half the guys would carry it. But the, the catch with it is, is they said it was very meticulous, very temperamental weapon. And it certainly wasn't for everybody. If you didn't stay on top of the gun and keep it clean, you were gonna have issues with it. But if you could do that and keep up on top of it, they loved the weapon system for what it offered them. This gun, hopefully someday you guys will be able to handle one, very lightweight. That's the first thing you notice when you pick it up, is just how light it is, particularly for, in, in these two configurations, this is a Stoner 63, this is a 63A. Both of these are in belt-fed configurations, but it's amazing how light it is. Very deceiving. Yeah, it is. It up, it's deceptive, especially handling the 240s and the 46s and 48s in modern day. You generally think that material handling and design aspects, would, the guns would get lighter and lighter. But picking this gun up, it's significantly lighter than even the current guns that we have in the system. And what it strikes me, and in many ways it's a revolutionary gun, just like the FG-42 was, is the FG-42 was designed, and instead of like most military equipment or military small arms, they kind of always err on the side of overbuilding things for strength and reliability and durability. The FG-42 and the Stoner 63 series, to me, they kind of leaned the other way, in my mind. They felt like, hey, this solution will get the job done in its adequate durability, there's no sense in overdoing it. And what it makes for is a, is a gun that very light and maneuverable. I mean, it's just amazingly so. The one thing I did notice, lighting this up not too long ago with a friend, a couple friends of mine, you gotta keep that bad boy lubed. It has to be wet. Okay, here's the basic premise on this. It was introduced in the early 1960s by Cadillac Gage. It was Eugene Stoner's brainchild. And it's essentially to take a common receiver and be able to format it into a variety of different variants. Eight, as far as we know, correct? Including the survival rifle, yes. Right, so you can flip the receiver upside down one way or the other, and you put on a trigger pack, or a belt feed mechanism, or in the case of a Bren or a top feed mechanism, and different barrels and different configurations, and you can turn this gun in anything from a carbine like this, up to, in theory, a medium machine gun that you would have on a tripod. So it's very adaptable. It's kind of like the Lego set of small arms. And we were just talking before we started filming here, it's unlike any other small arm that's ever been made in that regard. I cannot think of another weapon that is as modular as the Stoner 63 family is. That's absolutely right. There is actually, like you said, military history and development. There's nothing I can think of that is more modular than this system. It also added to a lot of complexity, which probably caused a lot of the problems, which meant that it you know, never ended up getting adopted. Like you said, the, the multiple different machine guns, even to include a port, uh, port firing solenoid weapon. I think from what I've seen, the only weapon system that I've seen in current day that have even didn't even come close to it, but tried the modularity aspect of it was the SCAR weapon system. Correct. Going with the light and the heavy and the different variations in the sniper rifles. And I know that, you know, long term, the vision was to have that even be a long range sniper rifle and 300 Winchester short magnum and stuff. And once again, though, you just see a similar trend come out as with this, with that. And sometimes when you create the Swiss Army knife, it does a little bit of everything, but it does nothing very well. And so it kind of, in some aspects, falls short. In some aspects, it shines, but it still ends up being dedicated back to a niche weapon. Yeah, and, and there's no doubt here the complexity is the enemy. If you are a KISS principal guy and you're, you're a fan of keeping things simple, this is not your gun. Really cool gun, and, and, and for a gun guy like us, you know, 
it's really neat the, the thought process that went into getting this entire system to work together seamlessly as a belt fed or a carbine or whatever is very impressive but when you look at the average guy the average joe average marine average army guy or whatever this is so far over his head you got to remember there's a reason why AKs are so popular around the world and they're such a simple weapon system. This is kind of on the polar opposite of an AK family weapon. And like you said, that's why guys like us love it. Right. Just the sheer, you know, the, the ingenuity that's involved with this and the complexity of it. And obviously for me with the background, I mean, when I learned, you know, what, you know, SEALs were in the Navy and, and, and you know, the teams and all that kind of stuff, this was the gun. Everything you read in the Vietnam era stuff, this is the iconic quintessential gun when they got their reputation without a doubt built, was built with this gun in their hands yeah the 63a here this is the most famous variant of the stoner family now we have a 63 down here 63a here and then we have a 63 converted in a carbine format in the middle and bottom line as far as we know only a couple thousand of each flavor were made so this is, these are exceedingly rare guns they're some of the rarest machine guns in the world frankly Stoner 63 came online after some military testing, they identified some flaws. Number one, ejection port is such that with the left hand feed, it actually deflected cases right into the belt feed mechanism. That was a major problem. They also had to do some upgrades to the gas system. They realized there were some deficiencies there, such as the fact that the, the gas tube is now stainless steel on the 63A and add adjustable gas regulator. Change the charging handle, which is interesting now on the 63A, it's in the handguard, uh, which I thought was very interesting. And you know what else they did, um, which I certainly don't agree with, but if you look at the guys being trained on M1 Grands and even M14s, is they moved the selector and they kind of separated the, the safety aspect of the selector and the actual mechanical safety itself, it separated the two. And on a 63A, it has an M1 Grand or M14 style safety in front of the trigger guard and a fire mode selector as we would normally see it on the side. Problem with that, of course, is we found out anytime you got to put your finger in the trigger guard to put the gun on or off safe, that's a bad plan. All right. Of course, you got to remember where they came from. They're used to the M14, M1 Garand. Now, Monty, based on your time in, you never got a chance to get any trigger time behind the 63A? No, never did. They were out of the system by the time I came in. Right, and the saw, the M249, had replaced it. And that whatnot. wasn't even in service yet. Actually, when I came in, this weapon system had come, gone completely out. The only belt fed that we had was the uh, M60 Echo 3s. We moved to the Mark 43s. And then uh, eventually, after years of me being in, then we went to the modified 249 as the Mark 46. Now, I want to bring up something here I thought was kind of cool. You told me the one guy, I think the guy that just retired, was adamant that the Mark 46 would have flutes on the barrel, right? Uh, uh, absolutely. Uh, the Mark 46, like, he was uh, hell-bent that it was going to have a fluted barrel on it because yeah. it was going to help with surface area and cooling and all that kind of stuff. Which so. is obviously a carryover from the 63A. Absolutely. He, he carried it on the 63A. He wanted a heavy fluted barrel, on it, and that is the driver why the 46 has it. That's, that is very cool. So, yeah, that is the gun. That's my grail. You got it, baby. Hey, thanks for watching the Vickers Tactical YouTube channel. To subscribe, click here. And to watch some of my favorite videos, click here. Have a good one. LAV out.